Welcome to this week's Calling a City to Life podcast, still by Queen's Park Baptist Church in Glasgow. We're still in Glasgow, we're still Queen's Park Baptist Church. How is everybody this morning, Brody? Hey, I, I need to think about that. I, so <laughs> I woke up to Alison has a car, uh, she has to go somewhere for work today with a flat tyre. So the way that we inflate the tyre is with a bicycle track stand pump. Which, so that's my <laughs> exercise for the morning. So, um, and the problem is a, a, a leaky valve. So, Vaseline is your friend. It clogs up the valve and stops the air coming out. <laughs> well, is that there too you go. Much There's, information? That's a uh, <laughs> Queen's Park Baptist Church DIY corner for this week. Uh, Ian, how are you this morning? Yeah, practical tips are, are us. Um, <laughs> yeah, my daughter had a nail in her tire yesterday morning, so we were WhatsApping advice at this time yesterday. Um, so uh, <laughs> turned out uh, she managed to solve the problem, but doesn't have a way of inflating the tire. So she's going out to a car resource environment to purchase something that can uh, reinflate her tire uh, if she has this problem right. again. <laughs> How but other facilities are available. Yeah, I think it's called a pump. <laughs> Jack, how are you this morning? I mean, I'm grateful I didn't have to drive to work because then this issue <laughs> wasn't like, then this issue like, wasn't an issue for me. But I remember when I did have to drive to work, there was nothing more stressful than walking out to your car and seeing a flat tire or a car issue of any sort. It's just, you know, it just messes with the the plan of the whole day and it just sets you off on the wrong thing. So hopefully, Alison's day is feeling calm now no <laughs> i'm sure it'll be fine and so long as it doesn't go down again while she's parked where she's got to go <laughs> good stuff well the advantage of driving tractors the last time i came out and saw a nail it was in the nail of a tractor tire which you just pull out a pair of pliers and go on with the rest of your day <laughs> <laughs> so there we go right that's a you know Car weekly tips catch up. for this weekly catch up and car tips for this morning. Now this weekend was slightly different. It was an all in service. We had Mary speaking on Esther, which we will touch on. I dare say through some of the questions that we're going to be speaking about. But we did decide to make it a another question and answer show. It went down particularly well last time. So we will intersperse a red question or two with some audio from everybody uh, who was kind enough to ask us questions. But if you're encouraged, once you hear all these great questions to submit your own, then the, the question, the hotline is always open. So email office at qpbc.org with a question and we'll no doubt do this again in the future and we'll add your question to the pile so last time we kind of rated the questions and got you to select one i think we'll do it differently this time because they're they're well yeah they've, they've all got they've all got their challenges they're not all straightforward so let's start with one that was actually a written question from laura and that is what has God done for you in the last week? Okay, who's who's brave enough to tackle this first? Jackie, you brave wow. enough. Wow. Have I just thrown you under the bus? <laughs> I mean, I feel like apart from anything else, we should always be asking Ian and Brody first. Okay. But, um, I mean, the, the instant answer is what has God done for me in the last week kept me together would be the sort of... <laughs> funniest response I feel though not just in the last week in the last couple of weeks God has been speaking to me about how little I seem to understand about how he loves me even when I'm screwed up um, and I feel that there have been lots of little things that have happened in my life that I feel have been gentle nudges of his encouragement that even although I don't have it all together, he's still patient with me and he has much more tolerance for me than I have for myself. So, I mean, I'm not saying that's just in the last week. It's kind of a constant life battle, <laughs> but it's been particularly relevant in the last couple of weeks. Good stuff. Ian Brody. Yeah, happy to kind of dive in. It's a great question. Um, and I think I went from a specific question to a general answer because it just made me think about what God is actually doing for us and particularly what he's doing for us when we're not aware of what he's doing. So I think my answer would actually in a sense be the same as Jackie's. What has God been doing for me in the last week? Well, he's been holding everything together. He's mm -hmm. been holding the universe together, which has been quite convenient when you try and Handy. walk around the planet. Um, I think, he, you know, he has 
provided for us uh, at every level. I mean, it's something I can't quite remember how many years it is since I kind of stepped out of earning a living and trusting God, you know, and, and here we are every week with food on the table and lots of provisions. So, you know, God's provided for us. Um, I just think spiritually, you know, we have resources, experiences, um, history uh, to stand on, um, a testimony of God's interaction in our lives. So when, once you actually start counting up these things that are actually the unseen things that you have every week, it's absolutely massive. Um, but also just kind of specifically what has God been saying to me? I think just on top of that, I've been really challenged about what it means to be courageous um, and what does it mean to be brave um, in a culture which is becoming more um, hostile, I guess, in some ways to, to Christianity. So it's, it's more of a a, a curious itch um, rather than a, a solution. But I just feel God's been saying, well, we need to think about this. So that's kind of maybe my story for the last week or so. Cool. Brody? Partly, I don't like the question. Ian thinks it's a great <laughs> question. I don't like the question. Um, uh -huh. I... Please, Laura, don't take any offence at this. And one of the reasons <laughs> don't I don't like things. I don't like the question is it's a bit kind of like capitalistic, isn't it? Of like, you know, God is a service provider and we are the consumers. So I like the question of what are the signs that you've seen of God at work around you or, or in you? Because it's a bit too individualistic as, as well. Um, but to answer the question anyway... Um, because I think, you know, we should be looking for signs of, of God at work of last week, the SLT met to prayer. And I was just so encouraged that as we were praying for each other and seeking God for each other and for the church of somebody would start to pray. And then once he'd finished, somebody else would say, do you know what? God was saying the exact mm -hmm. same thing to me. Um, so just that encouragement that God is speaking to us and we're hearing from him. And to tie it into perhaps one of the other questions that will come from, and I think both Ian and Jackie have alluded to this, of one of the things that stood out for me in the series that we've been doing is kind of like a wee kind of like side theme to that is uh, not of the upfront things that God is doing, but the things that God is doing in the background. And therefore, just that sense of come back to you want, you want some rest, Richard, of that sense of being able to rest in... You know, God is God is at work, even when I'm not seeing him at work. And I need to just uh, trust and rest in that and stay close to him. Because I think that's the the, the the key in all of this, is, is staying close to God, uh, staying open to him and having our eyes uh, open to what he's doing. Hmm. Yeah, my answer to this, I think, is, I suspect it's fairly similar to, to you guys. But when I hear this question at first, my instant reaction is to go, nothing. God's doing nothing in my life. Everything's terrible. Woe is me. And then I contextualised it a bit in the kind of Esther thing where uh, Mary was speaking about the weekend. And it's, I suppose, famous as being a, a book of the Bible that doesn't mention God. And I think I began to feel a bit like that, that it is, as you kind of allude to, Brody, it's not about identifying a specific from day to day that is going on, but it is a bigger picture of a pattern of God at work. And yes, there are individual things, there are moments, there are seasons where you can say, yeah, that was a very specific response to prayer. But if you ask me in this particular week, then I'm not thinking about a specific thing. What I'm thinking about is zooming out a bit and looking at the overall pace, the overall a picture of life and saying you know what I can actually see God's hand in moving things God's hand in relationships God's hand in just speaking through the things that I see around me and the people I speak to and you know even things like living in a farm nature and just those moments of reflection of yeah I can see God's handiwork more than most can by just looking out my window and seeing everything around me so I don't know if 
that answers any of Laura's questions. But it be it's it's one of the things that I think the series has pointed out, and I think I think Jack, you said this privately, so be prepared to be thrown under the bus again, which was that during the summer, church doesn't appear to have had that kind of tailing off that you sometimes see while lots of folk are away and everything just gets a bit calmer and quieter. Church really seems to have just keeps building week to week. I have, I mean, I play the drums as many folk will know, but some people listen to podcasts who don't come to church won't know that. So I generally sit facing a degree of the congregation, uh, unlike most people who you all have your back to each other. And the number of faces I see of people, I'm like, I have never seen you before. I have no clue who you are. And it's folk just walking in the door and church just seems to have been really uh, just... Exciting. Exciting. Just like uh, on... uh, Without wishing to use a a kind of staid phrase of on fire, but it really does. It's it's great. And I think actually, if you were to say what's God been doing, it's really been focus around the church setting on Sundays, I think I can really see God's hand at what's been going on and the relationships that people seem to be building and developing and new relationships and new people and all the rest of it. So there you go. Hopefully that answers the question somewhat. Right. Next up then, I... We touched on a few weeks ago, I think it was mentioned that some of our youth had been away at a festival called Magnitude and it's that kind of time of year where folk are at things like Keswick and is new wine still a thing? I don't know. Ke- is Keswick still a thing? <laughs> new wine's Keswick, still a thing. New, new, wine. wine's just, yeah. new wine's just finished. Spring Harvest. Is Spring Harvest still a thing? It is, it is yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. And uh, Magnitude is the kind of latest thing that's held up at the SU premises up north. And there were a lot of folk that were at that. And so we have a question from one of the people that was actually there. How can we ensure worship is relevant and current for young people and adults? Okay, so that was Amy asking, how do we ensure that worship is relevant and current for young people and adults? That's not a loaded question if ever there was one, Amy. Thank you for that. But yeah, how do we cater... Well, you guys, two passers, how do you manage to cater for everybody? How do you scratch everybody's itch? You don't. (laughs) It's it's, it's a simple answer. I think, I mean, Amy, thanks for your question. And it's a really good question. And it's great to hear from a, a young person. And there is that challenge, isn't there, of how do we worship God together in a way that, so we've been using the phrase, we're, we're all in. Um, and I think that's the, the, the question is one, not perhaps of relevancy, but what does it mean to faithfully worship God in a way that all hearts and lives are engaged? And that's a big, that's a big question. I think one of the things that I have always appreciated and enjoyed about QP is that do you know what? Because we've got different worship leaders and different people preach, there's a mixed menu, for want of a better phrase. And so it's not all the same. But I think a lot of it's got to do with not actually what happens from up front, but how we treat each other and our openness to each other. So again, something else I've always appreciated about QP. And here I'm thinking of some dear saints that are now worshipping Jesus face to face is, do you know what, their openness for the next generation to encounter God. And I think that's one of the, this that kind of like partly ties in with, with I think another question that might be coming of, you know, how are we both modelling and encouraging faithful worship? And it's not just a Sunday, is it? Because we worship God every day of the week. So uh, that might be, I don't know if that answers your question, Amy, but that's that's some thoughts. But thank you for your provocation. Next up. <laughs> I'll, st- <laughs> I'll stick my foot in uh, as well. Probably going to say something similar to, to what Brody uh, said. First, big shout out to Amy. Thank you for the question, Amy. Um, I, 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 I th- 
I think there's two ways you can come at worship. I think sometimes worship is um, intentionally designed, as it were, for a particular congregation. And that might be an approach that a new start church or a particular uh, event might uh, might go. Um, so you would design something that you think is, and I'm thinking maybe particularly more about song worship here. You might design something you think would be for this particular group. I think what's happened for us, and I think what is um, more healthy in the long run, is that that worship rises up from a very specific context and community. And so it is an expression of who we are. I mean, it's not a full uh, expression of all that we are. It's, it is a, um, a snapshot in a sense. But I think that is a much more authentic. So I think my first word about worship is, in from a human point of view, it needs to be grounded in the genuineness of, of who we are. So it's a real expression of who we are. But then I think the second thing is actually, it has to also stretch us. So I, I think worship that is productive and transformative also has to have a bit of an edge to it. So there's something about, I ought to be becoming uncomfortable or worship should be disrupting me in some kind of a, a way and stretching me um, enabling me to say things and to express things that I can't just work out for myself because you get very narrowly um, stuck in your own expression so worship should stretch me out of my comfort zone and I think thirdly it also has to have that and we've really benefited from this as Brody's already said it we have to kind of hold all of that in a very gracious way um and i just really been been struck by the journey that we've been on um as a church over many decades really where um certainly back in in the day a number of people were very open to allowing fresh expressions of worship to come in even though that was not their preference um and in order that actually something that would be authentic and an expression of the context and the people and particularly the younger people who were part of the fellowship at that time would be um just brought in and i think the challenge for those of us who are maybe were those young people um but and now the old people is that we need to follow on from what folks did many years ago and graciously curate the new things that are coming in and kind of hold that in a way that gives uh, younger people space to bring something that's that's fresh so i hope that's helpful amy yeah i mean i have a couple of thoughts i can remember when i was young um there was the first kind of breakout in Edinburgh of a thing called City Lights that was actually held in St. Paul's and St. George's Church in Edinburgh. And it was young people coming together to worship on a Friday night. And it was just, it was so unlike church in that it was much cooler and edgier. And it sort of felt like a young people's rebellion. And there was something, there was something, not rebellion in a bad way, but there was something really wonderful about this sort of sense of something that was very tailored to young people. And I think obviously if you've come away from something like magnitude, where it is so tailored to people of a particular age, you, you know, darkened rooms, very particular musical arrangements, you know, that are much more suited to, to very, very young people and that probably a lot of us might not enjoy, then it's easy to then see that church can can look much different from that and I think you have to acknowledge that those things are, are different and you can't actually replicate something like magnitude within your own church however that being said I do think if you're a young person and you're thinking about can I bring my friends to church you know that can then feel like a more difficult thing if you're not sure that what is happening in a worship sense feels young in some way. So I do think we have a responsibility to feel like we're trying to be current. Um, and I don't know exactly what that looks like. So in some ways I'm not really answering the question, but I do see, as as Brody said, that there's a, there's a sort of provocation in the question. And I do think it requires thought and reflection. But also, obviously, anything we do has to be done authentically and with integrity and to the best of our ability. Um, as we serve the Lord, you know, it's that's those are all important factors in that. But I definitely feel like it's a really interesting question because we are a full church and obviously we have 
people of all ages and you can't think that you're trying to cater for one group and not the other but we definitely have a requirement to be tolerant to others and to see that young people uh, have different needs in some ways than older people yeah I, I'm I you know you three are church leaders I, I, I'm not so I'm going to speak about this a bit differently I remember as a young person in church just being a complete troublemaker and I mean nothing's of, changed at this point nothing's much changed <laughs> just in terms of the youth and you know we were just so like demanding I mean, we must have been absolutely unbearable but I think in a sense we need to encourage that it's not just about us saying what is acceptable, what are we prepared to put up with, but it's about saying to the youth, come on then, show us how it's done. You know, it's about saying, you know, you know, bring it on. Because Ian, your comment is right. I dread to think what it will be like, like how, I don't wish to denigrate old people because I am now old, <laughs> but, you know, 40 years from now, what worship's going to be like in the way that what worship was like 40 years ago and how, like... Uncomfortable you'll feel. Uncomfortable that's going to make me feel 40 years from now when it's all, I don't know, it'll all be AI, chat GPT generated <laughs> worship songs or something. No. But, so, all I would say to, uh, what I would say to young people is just, you know, be revolutionaries, you know, come make it hard for all the rest of us that are involved in worship and leadership, bring the challenge. So, yeah, so... Viva Revolution, or whatever it is. <laughs> anyway, there we go. So you can be dealing with that at your next uh, leadership meeting. <laughs> can, I have a, can I have another bite of the cherry? Yeah, go on then. <laughs> of, because I think as well, so there, there's, there's, there's challenges around this because, you know, we've all, we've all been where Amy was at one point, mm. haven't we, in, in many respects. You know, and I can remember, I can remember being part of a youth group where, kind of like, the youth leader said, "Let's pray that some of the old folk get promoted." You can. <laughs> 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 but when we look at kind of like, so Revelation four is not a picture of future worship; it's a picture of worship in heaven just now. And there we see people from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every generation worshiping God together and we want to be like that we want to be an image of of heavenly worship and therefore there is a challenge while we want to recognize that as different generations and different cultures we bring well it's what do we bring rather than what about that separates us so for me at the heart of worship is is relationship it's an expression of my relationship to God, but it's also that how do we encourage each other? Um, so I've got a responsibility to encourage those around about me by participating and singing and not sitting looking grumpy or, or whatever. So we all have a contribution to bring in our worship when we gather, whether we're on the platform or sitting in a, in a seat. So that would be kind of like part of my encouragement to us all, no matter what age we are of, whether the song ticks our box or not, I'm there to worship God, and so I want to give him my best. And I think, you know, if we can kind of like foster that heart attitude, then it's a good step forward, along with other practical things we maybe need to uh, do that are, are practically more challenging in some respects. But, but relationship... Well, just I've kind of given a little bit of an encouragement there, which is, you know, be revolutionaries and turn it up to 11. Brody, you've given a little bit of an encouragement there. I'm just going to drop in Susie's question and then we'll give Jack and Ian a chance to answer it directly. Get a sense that a lot of our young people have been doing lots of things over the summer and they've bring in that back to their families but we need them to be bringing that back to their church family and telling us about their experiences so that we can encourage them but also that they feel that they belong in a church so how can we encourage our young people to feel that they belong and that they're part of our church family Jack, Ian a specific encouragement 
or a specific way in which we can encourage younger folk to feel like they're part of the church? Well, I think the comment really is around people sharing their stories. Um, and I just think that that would be wonderful. And maybe this mm-hmm. is an opportunity just to, um, you know, express that for anyone who is listening. I think we just love to hear um, some personal testimony of what God's been uh, doing, how God's been at work over the last few months in, in people's lives, particularly if folks have been uh, away at some kind of a event. That would that would just be, mm-hmm. uh, be amazing. Um, I think there's also an incentive, as, as Brody said, really to think about, well, what do I actually bring? And, um, you know, I, I think it would be just it would be good it's always a challenge but it's always something we need to be um leaning into is 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 how we embrace engage and and involve young people um and so i think i just want to say in this context you know there's not an embargo an age embargo Mm -hmm. on contributions and and how people serve and whether that's serving within youth ministry or serving within wider um ministries uh, as well and so it would just be uh good to have folks and um, contributing across across all ages. Yeah, I mean, I think it's great to hear the testimonies of what happens in these sort of summer situations for young people because they're often life defining and you know deeply significant because you're away from the rest of your family and you feel like it's an opportunity to to really discover yourself. And so I think these are really powerful moments, and I think it is wonderful to hear them, to be encouraged by them. And just touching back a little bit on Amy's question, I think they're also, I think for all of us who are in the older category, the remembrance that when you are a teenager or a young adult, music is deeply emotive and is massively, you know, everyone's gone off and they're whatever period of discovering whatever artists they're into and, and lying in the room with headphones on listening to things. And the way in which a uh, Christian music, I, I don't want to sort of start making music Christian and non-Christian, but the way that worship music then in particular is is connecting with someone or is working as a, a vessel to allow someone to connect with God. It really is a hook for people in that age and stage of life in a way that we all as older and more ma- mature Christians have worked past the point of, you know, give me any song and, and I will and I will manage to worship God with it. But that is a very different thing when you're young and you feel like you want to have the lyrics that are very specifically saying what's on your heart in some way or another. And I think it is acknowledging and understanding young people in that way as being on that real journey of discovery towards who God is to them and how he manages to to speak to their hearts. And I think music is really significant in that just because they're young people. I think there's a, sorry, Richard, I think there's a really, we, we've all got a part to play in this as well. So there's the kind of like the, the upfront, but in some respects of, you know, how do we include young people more, etc. But there's a really simple answer to this. And I know that Susie already does this, and that's speak to them, learn their names, encourage them. Ask them their stories. I am so thankful. As so, I've got I've got two boys who are no longer teens. One who will be a teen for another couple of months, and I am so thankful for people in the church who have been a godly influence on them because they became their friends. There, are, my my boys have people older than me in the church that they would think of as friends, and that's been huge, huge. Um, uh, because these people have been able to speak into their lives in a way that as their dad has has been hard for me, but just also as godly examples, because I think that's the thing as well, of there's the danger, isn't there, that we reduce church to everything that happens up front on a Sunday, where church is so much more and richer than that. And I know that's not what Susie means or is, is, is getting uh, but there's a really practical thing of when you see a young person, say hello to them, find out who they are, what's going on. Not in a really kind of like put them in a corner and pin them against a wall kind of way. Be gentle and friendly when you do this. But, but you know, let's let's mix the ages up, get to know each other, pretend as though we're back on Zoom and have to talk to a bunch of random strangers. Well, 
it seems like a suitable place to drop in a word of encouragement that Nick gave us. So we'll play that just now. I think the thing about this morning is um, remembering that we're chosen and called, we're and accepted just exactly as we are. And it's not about getting ourselves all prepared and ready to come to God and say, here I am. It's just like, no, come dirty. Come as you are, because I love you, I created you. And I think God's just really saying, you know, the schools are going back. Lots of things are changing. Lots of things are starting up again. And I feel like God's just saying, you know what, guys, just come back. My arms are open wide. Let me embrace you. I'll take you as you are. And let's just work together to step into that fullness of life that he has for each of us. Nick reflected something that I think we've said has been said quite a lot in church recently, which is that sometimes just make it, and we've said that this morning, sometimes just making it into the building on a Sunday should be viewed as being a success, that we don't all need to be rip-roaring, turning up to 11 revolutionaries, as I've just touched on uh, earlier, that it's okay to just be okay. Any reflections on that and what Nick said? I would agree just in the thing that I had said already this morning when we talked about what God's done for us in the last week. I think understanding and realising that it is not our efforts that allow God to use us. It's not our work that allows us to come together on a Sunday and worship God. It's all him all the time. And actually we do, we can be as, he uses the word dirty, but we can be as unclean, unput together on anything as possible. But his his redemption for us is still the same. It is not damaged by anything that I do. I, I think it's also, we have really touched on this quite a bit, that it is just digging into the foundations of on which we stand. Mm. And I think sometimes we can live our lives so superficially that, you know, we we bounce from a, a word of encouragement to a, a situation of discouragement, um, and we forget actually that that's not the soil from which we live. We live from a much deeper, richer um, environment that God has already established for us. And um, the reality, if we could see that just that bigger picture and that longer story, I think you know would give us a lot of more confidence. I, I think we I probably refer to this quite a bit, but it's been a bit of a theme I've been thinking about and reading over the summer, but this whole environment of anxiety that we live in, and I think that can be reproduced in a reactivity. So we're high one day, we're low the, the next day because of our circumstances. Um, but actually, there's something about standing on what God has done that gives us a level of composure uh, in the midst of an environment of of anxiety, and I, I I think kind of the learning from from Nick's word and really from what we've been saying is that I think for all of us just to push in and get a hold of what God has has actually done for us, um, not in terms of do you know I got a parking space outside Morrison's the other day, but actually do you know what I'm saved and protected for eternity. Um, I you know I'm a I am in the family of God. I am being transformed by a God who is moving towards me. So I think, you know, there's there's so much to be gained from the reality of who we are in Christ that, you know, digging into that is so important when so many other things are, are flying around. The thing that just kind of like dings with me with what Nick is saying is, do you know what? I come to church because the King of Kings, the creator of the universe, now that blows my mind, has invited me to come just as I am. I don't come because the worship's good, great that it was, thought Mary was fabulous on Sunday, Colin and the team led us in worship brilliantly, but I come because the creator of the universe invites me to be part of a body to worship him. And that's amazing. So I can, you know, it's, it's, we use those words quite often uh, as we gather round the Lord's table, don't we, of uh, come not because you're, you, you've earned it or you're worthy, but come because he's worth it. So, yeah, that's thank you for your encouragement, Nick. Great stuff. Well, 
Ian, you touched on and used the word foundation, which leads us nicely on to Jack's question. Here's Jack. This is probably easier to ask than it is to answer, Richard. How do we become receptive readers or listeners to the Word of God so that the words come off the page and into our lives? So Jack asks about the Word of God. I suppose maybe just a quick insight from everyone, maybe of a almost like a Bible study technique. What do you do in your own personal lives to take the foundation of God's word and take it off the page and apply it or make it travel from head to heart? Any, I don't want to over strategize it, but any particular techniques? You know, Ian Brody, you're both obviously immense studiers of the the word. How do you prevent it from just becoming an intellectual exercise? Read it in community. Mm, what does that involve? What does that involve? It involves talking about it with other people. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I think one of the big challenges that we have is that we create silos, don't we, or compartments. So I, I've grown up in the generation where the quiet time has been emphasised. And that's good. It's good to have that, that personal time before God. But here's a thought. Nearly every time the New Testament says you, it's in the plural. So the Bible is not just speaking to me, it's speaking to us. And I'm not clever enough in tune with God enough to figure it all out by myself. I need, and this is this is very Baptistic in many respects, I need you guys to chat this thing, you know, this stuff through. So sometimes I preach on a Sunday morning, while it can seem a bit kind of like, this is what the Lord's, in some respects, it's starting a conversation. But have conversations with each other, whether that's, you know, folk in your own household or a life group or you're out walking with some friends. Talk about this stuff. Say, I was reading such and such. If you, you know what? And together, as we chat through it, we discern what Christ is saying to us and maybe have that Emmaus Road moment. And I think as well, just off the back of that, let me give a shout out for the podcast because I think we are trying to do that to some extent uh, in this little group um, and trying to reflect on what we are together reading and responding to, um, particularly on a Sunday. I think it, I think I would agree with Brody. just maybe add a couple of other things that I find helpful. I think the first thing is the posture that you come at Scripture uh, from. So I think we need to come to Scripture believing that God, it's God that's addressing us in scripture, that this isn't just a, a puzzle book to kind of find out some some answers or um, to, to resolve some theological um, conundrums, but we will hear the voice of the Lord as we as we come. I guess that kind of encourages us to really, so be prayerful. Um, I, I think the other thing that's also really important is just how we how we hear the word. So I, I think for me, my my danger, I guess, in being familiar, particularly you get familiar with a particular translation as well, uh, and you just kind of, you know, run your eye through something and then you realise I haven't even, that's not passed through my mind or my heart, it's just gone across the page. So finding a way to arrest yourself as you are, are reading. So to read more slowly um, and honour what's well, been written by um, just taking time. And, and I kind of have to outmaneuver myself a little bit on that. So I find just using different translations, uh, using awkward translations, using translations that you, know, you bump up against the word and you say, I don't really like that. And then that, and, and for me, actually, one of the things I find quite helpful, certainly recently, is, is actually just bumping up against a phrase and then trying to chase it down. Um, so I've been reading in Revelation recently and so for example this morning read the expression the testimony of Jesus and so that's kind of my little thought worm for today 
what actually is the testimony of Jesus. Um, and then that kind of leads into, I suppose, what Brody is also saying is that there are different vantage points. You kind of get stuck in your own point of view and you need a community around you to, to help you to, to read, to listen and to hear. And some of that can be people who have written books. They can be dead people, but it also should be living people as as well. And and recognising that we read, we read humbly um, and that we haven't got the answers and actually I suppose if I were to look at my life I actually recognise now that there are things that I kind of would have believed fairly forcefully <laughs> a few years ago that I would now question so you you have to your views have to change and they often change by bumping up against other people who have different views and, and we have to really be open to that without kind of fearing or being very defended but actually being curious and expecting other people to speak so that, a few thoughts. I feel what's interesting about his question, it, well, it makes me think about the fact that when I was brought up in church, it was predominantly a church that was focused on the word. And I think that for where I am at this point in my life, I understand much more that how much I need the Holy Spirit to help me when I'm understanding any passage of scripture that I'm reading. And that particularly when it becomes how I'm applying it to my life. And that is not to say that all passages of scripture are things that are to be applied to our life. There's passages of scripture that are information and their story and they're part of, you know, putting the wider, particularly Old Testament passages together. But when there are when there are places where it's particularly something that, okay, I need to to learn about this thing or I want people to, to apply this, then I need the Holy Spirit. And I need to be convicted of it in a place that is not just my head it needs to be something in my heart and oftentimes I have found that God is much kinder to me about those things than I ever am to myself I think when we read scripture and it just feels like oh I'm such a failure then that doesn't feel like God's heart towards me I think that when God speaks to us about something he he does it in a way that is much more of an invitation into living life in a in a fuller way um, as he intended us to and it's much easier to be transformed when you feel someone's love and invitation to be transformed as opposed to feeling like someone's disappointment. And I think that's been a big shift for me that as I read scripture now, seeing it through the lens of uh, a father who is trying to help me to live life the way that he had always intended, as opposed to someone who's just disappointed in me. You know, that, that scripture is so full of all that we need, but the Holy Spirit needs to help and convict my heart in ways as well. Excellent. Well, I'll just be immensely practical because I like books and I like stay straight and I like shopping. So I recommend a wide margin Bible that you could put notes in and a set of colouring pens or pencils. I remember, I don't know what the guy's name was. It was way back in the day, but he had this strategy whereby you underlined in the Bible, you know, if it was talking about Jesus, you underlined it in red pencil or if it was sin, it was black. It was the end times. It was gold or something like that. And it made you read it slowly. It made you take it in. And it was also fun to do colouring in. So there you go. <laughs> Who doesn't like a bit of colouring in? As Brody said at the weekend was it Brody or was it Matt who somebody said was talking about carring in at the weekend it's maybe Mary can't have been you was it Mary somebody was talking about carring in at the weekend uh, I think there is something to be said Richard for for some of us who who are actually processed by by writing mm. and I, mm. I kind of have resisted that for a long time and um and I'm not a consistent journaler but actually I I find that when I write things down I write things down that I didn't realise I knew or yeah. actually is much more wise than what I ever imagined. <laughs> so I just think having a little book beside you, I've got mine here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I actually just write in a few notes, even if it's just a couple of sentences yeah. um, every now and then and, and you've captured something. So I think that's a really, I find mm -hmm. that really helpful as well, just to, to write things down. And, and um, it's another excuse to buy stationery, which again, I'm always, I get overexcited. This time of year, schools are going back. Who doesn't want to buy new stationery? Anyway, right, final question for the show. This is from David. So first of all, I want to say thank you guys for doing the podcast. It's really appreciated. Thanks for all your hard work uh, that's going into that. And for my question, we've been doing Further Up and Further In for a while now. Is there one character that's really stood out for you as we've gone through these stories? 
And also, is there something that surprised you or struck you as new that you hadn't seen before uh, in any of these stories? Okay, so thank you, David, for listening, obviously. Uh, a character that stood up in this series, to St- gentlemen. Stood up. St- stands out. Well, it stood out. Stood out. Stand, <laughs> stood, out. stood out. Stood, stood up. Whatever. Anyway. <laughs> we did have one that was knocked over. We had some <laughs> knock, knocked over, <laughs> pinned in the head. It's, it's been quite a violent series. And uh, that foreshadows we were about to go next. We'll talk about that shortly. Gents, you were preaching it. Is there one character you'd like to go back to and do have a redo, a do-over, or say more about? I, I think the character who actually... Um, stimulated the series at least for for me was was david and i think that still uh remains in the story of uh, of david and goliath the series was intended to uh, remind us of some of the the pivot points for our spiritual growth um and i think there's this really seminal moment where david is facing goliath and he's given these um the, this advice so he has his family Kind of tell them what what on earth are you doing? You know, get back to the hills, young man. Um, and then you've got Saul saying, you know, here's my armor. Why don't you you put this on? Um, and on all this this pressure that comes from his family of origin, it comes from the, his social setting around. It comes from good advice and from military strategy. So he has all of this um, context, but um, this. In, in God, he is able to, and the word that is kind of um, spinning in my head is the word differentiate, which is a very specific word that talks about him being able to separate himself out from his own history and culture and become courageously God's God's person um, and do a very different thing in God. And I think for me, that's kind of been the theme that sort of led uh, into the series uh, about being able to determine that which we've just simply picked up, not dump it all because you can't just cut yourself off from your past, but actually uh, reimagine it and re- and reinterpret it under God and out of that live a life of faith, adventure and um, and do things that have never been done before. So if David had just simply done what his family script had told him to do or his cultural context had indicated, he would never have been the man of God that he became. And I think what stands out is that he was able to um, find what God had for him and God wanted him to do um, and was able just to, by faith to step into that. So I'm, 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 I'm David in this kind of, uh, in this story. Brody, what stood out for you? Hey, lot stood out for me. I, do you know what? I appreciate getting to preach, but I also appreciate being able to listen to others preach. So I've uh, enjoyed this series. And, and going back to Jack's question as well, I think, Richard, you said something uh, important, and that's read slow. Um, you know, so quite often I'll get stuck with you know, one chapter or a short section and, and that's where I am for a week or even even longer, just mulling that that over. A couple of things uh, stood out for me. So the guy with the, it, well, what people have learned is Brody struggles to say Old Testament names. I apologise for this. <laughs> so Mike. Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, there's a, there's a, there's there's something to be kind of like uh, thought about there of of what does it mean to live with a disability um, and worship and and that of the people that I preached on the the the, the one that I enjoyed it's the wrong word but was really challenged with and and kind of like saw things afresh through was was Naomi um, really appreciated being able to kind of like spend some time it felt as though I spent some time with Naomi um, and that was a good a, a good thing to do and just that that kind of like how she put on a false a false identity that started to define her I can remember being in a soup kitchen somewhere meeting a lady who wouldn't give us her real name she called herself Shadow and it was a bit like Naomi calling herself Mara that she'd become bitter and how she was it took 
God at work in the background and Ruth and a, a community to nurse her back to back to health. Jack, highlight. I mean, I may have said this before, so forgive me if I have, but at the beginning of COVID, I did read the Bible in a year. Well, I obviously didn't do it at the beginning of COVID, but I started it at the beginning of COVID. And it gave me a love for the Old Testament that I had never had before. So for us to have spent these last few weeks being in the Old Testament, I have just, I've loved every single one of them. For every one, I think we could have stayed on each topic for about four weeks because I just think there is so much to be found there. The thing that I love about the Old Testament is the mundane na nature of the stories and the circumstances. It just feels that there is always something which is so relatable because it's people just living their lives. It's just the reality of their lives and their circumstances, which oftentimes are not relatable in that I have never put a tent peg through anyone's head. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I have removed on hidden all the tent pegs in the house now. There are no tent <laughs> pegs to be found anywhere. <laughs> so there, there's obviously some parts of it which are so kind of, you know, jarring and shocking and surprising, but there's also so much of it which is just so real and so wonderfully helpful and understanding it all in the context of the whole story of scripture. And as Brody said the other week, I think it was last week, God is not different and God God is not changed from Old Testament to New Testament. God is the same God in both. So to to find that reality of him in the Old Testament for me, I, I just I love it. I love it. I've loved it all. I want Good to stay. stuff. <laughs> well, thank you all very much for your questions. I do like the idea of Testimony Corner. So if you have something that you would like to share, tell us, then do get in touch with the show. We can either record it with you directly or you can send in your own audio clip. But it'd be really great to hear uh, some you know, just a, a word from people on a more regular basis as to just what God is doing in their life and how they're finding things. So do send that in, get in touch with us, uh, office at qpbc.org. Uh, we are switching up a bit in a couple of weeks. I'm not sure quite when the new series starts. Are we finished in the old series? Are we done and dusted? Or have we still got more to come? There's one more to go. Oh, no, what's the final? Maybe we should give a prize for who can guess where we're going to go with uh, the last one. Oh, okay. So, well, I can't really ask Brody to guess because presumably he knows. Jackie, have a guess as to who we're doing last. Oh, I have no idea. I, th I thought this was like, you know, for listeners, not us. Oh, no, but, yeah, but we get to guess too. <laughs> I can't. Gosh, no, I can't. Who would it be? I no. mean, there's so many left, actually. I mean, as Jackie says, you know, you, we just really dipped our toe in this. Yeah. So there's a there's a whole pile to go. So maybe it's unfair I'm going, to ask people to guess. I'm going Jehoshaphat just so that Brody has to say it. Lots. <laughs> it's not me that's preaching, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> and then... G Gideon's a good shout. Yeah, I have a big Gideon fan. Big Gideon fan. Yeah. Anyway, there we no, go. Well, yeah, let's, let's hold it off and people can, can find out at the time. Great stuff. And then we are switching up in a few weeks' time. We're going from old, from, you know, the left-hand side of the Bible, if you like, to the right-hand side of the Bible. And we're advancing all the way to end. Can you want to give us a steer of what's to come, Ian? Or is yeah, it, or we're is it right secret? At... <laughs> <laughs> we're right at the, at the end of the Bible, so we're going to dive right into Revelation. Um, and I think for a lot of people, the book of Revelation is both an enigma, uh, and a scare story. So I think we're going to be looking at the way in which Revelation helps us to be courageous disciples, uh, in, in a fearful world. So uh, it'll be about hope, uh, over fear. And, uh, we do hope that it will kind of strengthen and galvanize us to, to be faithful disciples in in this these challenging times great stuff well it was the first book of the bible i ever read so maybe that explains a lot who knows anyway <laughs> i don't know you've got to start somewhere you might i mean you might as well start at the end see how it finishes it seems reasonably sensible to me at the time it's not like i had anybody guiding me it's like here's this bible well how does it finish <laughs> <laughs> it's a really long book to start. I, I knew the first bit because like everybody knows the first bit you just read the end see how it ends anyway there we go right great stuff thank you all very much for joining us uh, send us in your questions keep them coming uh, like review subscribe to the podcast you can also listen to it on YouTube 
Uh, so do subscribe there and make sure you follow the church on Twitter. We have a Twitter account. Do we have an Instagram? We have an Instagram account as well. So do hunt those out. All the social media outlets. Any final, final words from anybody? Brody, a word of encouragement? One sentence or less? Right, thank you for those who uh, were brave enough to do the audio bit and put in their questions. Thank you. Ian? Yeah, just shout out to all of you who put in questions. Really appreciate it. Hope we got somewhere roughly in this vicinity of an answer. And Jack? I'm grateful to listeners. Without listeners, there would be no point in us spending time together and it turns out it's quite fun. Oh, it's quite fun. I mean, if nobody was listening, I'd still want to do it because it is quite fun. Yeah, I don't know Where if all the rest of us would be. <laughs> well, okay. you, you would just be talking to each other. <laughs> well, that's what we do most of the time anyway. Good stuff, right? Thank you for joining us. Have a great week. Goodbye. Bye. bye. Thank you. Bye.